Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this episode of the Raphology series. Uh, today's episode is entitled uh, Code Blue. Uh, and with us today, um, I've invited a, a very good friend, Dr. Jonathan Chan, uh, who's an A&E physician. So John and I actually met when we were doing our ICU rotation in NUH, and it's quite apt today that we are talking about resuscitation. Uh, so I, I think we all know that we, we probably can't teach resuscitation in, in a didactic or a sit down talking session, but I think what I, what I hoped to, to bring with this session is um, John being an A&E physician does uh, resuscitation work day in, day out. Uh, and um, I guess for us, for many of us who work in the hospital inpatient setting, um, while, while we do get to uh, resuscitate patients, we probably don't do so at a frequency that really allows us to get very uh, good and proficient at it. And also I think uh, John having rotated through uh, during his SR years through the wards uh, and seeing how sometimes things can be pretty suboptimal in the wards can hopefully bring his expertise and experience uh, where the A&E oftentimes, you know, uh, where resuscitation is really uh, run uh, very, very proficiently um, to give us some tips and suggestions of how we could do things uh, better. And I think also, especially for those um, listeners who have never attended to a Code Blue, um, probably uh, I'm pretty sure they will come when you have to. Uh, so hopefully this will, will help you along as well. So, okay. So John, um, maybe we can start with the first question. Okay. Hi, Tamin. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Yeah. So um, just a preamble before we start, right? This is not an ACLS lecture because there's an ACLS course for that. And uh, this is targeted to the junior doctors who will be the first responders during a code in the ward. Uh, and maybe to some of the registrants who are not so familiar with resuscitation as well. Mm. Uh, take note that most of the evidence for cardiac arrest come from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest scenarios, whereas here we are mainly dealing with in-hospital cardiac arrest scenarios, which is uh, slightly different. And the way uh, this differs is that um, in-hospital cardiac arrest, usually these cases show signs of deterioration prior to collapse and therefore can be preempted. But the lecture doesn't deal with all these early warning systems and things like that. It's more on the, like you say, the practical parts on how to deal with a cardiac arrest in a systematic fashion. So three things, let's get out of the way. Um, first, high quality CPR is associated with better outcomes. Secondly, intubation is not shown to be associated with better outcomes. And thirdly, uh, cardiocerebral resuscitation, CCR, or chest compression only CPR, uh, is as good as conventional CPR with ventilation. So now that this is out of the way, uh, yeah, let's come to what we do before attending to the patient. So I've had my best and my worst um, inpatient cardiac arrest codes in the same ward in NUH. I will not say which ward that is, but the first one occurred when I was a one month old house officer. <laughs> that one, we were, I was in the ward above this ward and I received a call and I ran down where uh, the nurses were attending to the patient in uh, full view of everyone else in that cubicle. Uh, the airway was taken by an uh, enrolled nurse who had the um, BDM mask all the way around. So you imagine if it's a triangle, it was uh, like that with the, with the pointy end pointed at the chin rather than at the nose. We went in with no PPE whatsoever. And later on, because I think it was an APO case, as we were doing CPR, blood was spraying out of the patient's mouth and the wall was flattened with blood and the nurses had to gown and visor and uh, uh, us while we were and masters while we were doing CPR at the same time. So that was very poor preparation. Okay, on the other hand, in the same ward, this time uh, one month after uh, meeting you I mean, in ICU, um, I had the best results um, inpatient where the registrar was very capable and the um, nurse in charge was actually an ACLS instructor. So she um, helped to coordinate the manpower the uh, reg threw out every non-essential personnel from behind the curtain so that there was just the bare minimum of people taking part in the recess and everyone had proper PPE on. Yeah, so that's the difference that uh, preparation does and it really sets the tone for the rest of the resuscitation. Okay, um, so um, usually for myself, I carry on my person one tonic K, one pair of gloves and a large four IV cannula. 
And why I do this is because Murphy's Law of Resuscitation states that when you arrive at the patient's bed site, you will always be on the other side of the bed from where the gloves are, and everyone will be too busy to give them to you. So I try and carry my own PPE with me. Yeah, so, uh, that, and now I think with the current uh, pandemic situation, we uh, have a focus on having the correct mask, having um, uh, eye protection, so on and so forth. So I think it's important that you take care of yourself before you take care of a patient. Yep. And you uh, don these things before you proceed to a cardiac arrest. It's okay to wear too many things and take them off later. But if you do a cardiac arrest, uh, a code, and it ends up being an infectious patient, you they may, there may be long-lasting consequences. Mm. Yes, so other than that, um, yes, there's information gathering is important. So any past medical history or circumstances which may give rise to reversible causes of cardiac arrest should be established. Take note, uh, especially about patients' immobility, something that we don't often think about. Um, pulmonary embolisms, or this can occur in the as well. Yeah. And uh, get enough people to come and attend to the patient. So if you need to call your ranch early, do so. If you need to call a uh, code team early, uh, do so as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of the information gathering bit, I guess sometimes like as a junior doctor, you're like not sure whether to run straight away to the patient. Should I spend maybe like a quick 10 seconds like browsing through the, the, the issues for this patient? Like practically speaking, like what, what do you normally do and what would you recommend? So I will pack this at the level of what happens when a P1 patient appears unannounced mm. in the emergency department. I will go and see the patient first and yeah. if there's time then I will uh, look at the clinical records later mm. on. Yeah, so I think um, you can't walk to the computer while everyone is walking to the cardiac arrest. And the computer tends to uh, hang at the time where you need it the most. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think you should just gather what information you can on the fly, but see yeah. the patient first. Yeah. yeah. Because Thanks. like if you are in the same situation as me and someone is handling the uh, chest compressions and the airway wrongly and you know mm. better, your intervention then and there can uh, change the outcome of the resuscitation. So I think it's the time sensitivity of uh, just really getting to the patient right away and ensuring that um, the basics of your initial resuscitation are, are correct. La, like you mentioned, how the BVM is placed, uh, CPR is ongoing and stuff like that. La. Yes. You might have noticed that uh, in resuscitation scenario, in code blue scenarios, everyone graduates towards the things that they know how to do the best. Mm. So you will see the phenomenon of three junior doctors trying to set one plug because yeah. we know how to set plug. And you see three nurses trying to spike one drip because they know how to spike drips. Yeah. So um, it, if you have a good idea of what is going on and you can distribute the manpower more uh, sensibly, um, then uh, your immediate intervention will be of use as well. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next question if you think yes. of it. Okay, yeah. So what are the things that you do immediately when you reach the patient? So I think uh, oftentimes, like let's say, like, like you mentioned, oftentimes if this is the first time attending the code, you're a bit flustered. Uh, yes, I mean, you remember ABC, ABC, but then like practically, um, what are the very initial things that you do once you reach the patient? Well, you need a quick history from someone who knows uh, what has happened especially of the downtime and you uh because you might be passing on this history to someone more senior later on yeah um i think if no one has already established a rhythm uh and what the um whether the patient is really in cardiac arrest or not it's okay to stop the code and do a pulse check there mm. so long as someone cannot tell you i have checked the pulse uh two minutes ago and the power and the rhythm was this if everyone is uncertain what the status of the patient is just stop uh, check the pulse, uh, establish what the rhythm is, and then start the clock from there. Yep. In terms of optimizing the bedside environment, you need privacy. So if you have screens, you can put up screens around um, the patient. Uh, we have ever resuscitated a patient in AMU before, uh, and you know how packed AMU is, but uh, with screens, I think uh, mm. it's still better than nothing. Now. Uh, you need space around the patient, so clear away the bedside tables, uh, mm. the chest or drawers, anything that might get in the way. Yep. Um, remove the back of the bed if you need, if if need be. Okay. And raise the height of the bed to um, a height that is suitable for everyone. The height of the bed, I'm not being too prescriptive about it because mm. a good height is good for the person who's intubating the patient, but it's difficult for everyone else who's doing CPR. 
So mm. just find whatever um, compromise, uh, whatever is best uh, for the team. But as I will emphasize very heavily later on, CPR takes uh, precedence over everything else. Mm. Yeah. So I guess it's not the physical bit also, then you would push it out because it's oftentimes flush against the wall and take yes. off the, 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 what's that called, the backing, the, the headlights yes. at the back. Uh, to, right. to open up the airway space. La. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So, um, um, yes. So, go ahead, go ahead. So, it's good uh, if you have time in the world, go and explore how your bits work, how your wall suction work, and so on and so forth as well. Because if mm. no one knows how to do it in the stress of the moment, it may have to be you. Yep. And I think a lot of the inpatient bits also have the auto collapse uh, sort of like a uh, quick release thing where you can sort of like the patient is like popped up and you want to make it like CPR friendly, then you can just uh, press the, the auto collapse function as well. Uh. Yes. Yep. O although I never tried it myself, but okay. Yeah, yeah sure, honestly, I've also never tried it, but yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Okay. Anything yeah. else in terms of like the initial assessment uh, and in terms of optimizing bed environments? I think that's about it really. You just okay. have to make sure the patient's really in cardiac arrest and what rhythm the patient is in. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, this excluding uh, later you discover maybe the patient is not in cardiac arrest and maybe just very hypotensive uh, mm -hmm. from a GIP, so on and so forth. But you know, that's probably a whole other part of your series. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next question. Uh, yeah, so I think you kind of alluded to this earlier on in terms about uh, role assignment, but I think uh, this is something that may be worth us talking a bit because I think the challenge is that oftentimes as a junior, you may be the first responder and then your second pair of hands come in like maybe one minute later, the next pair of hands comes in like slightly later and then you are on this constant um, like fly where you have to like meaningfully assign roles to different people as they come in. So perhaps you could take us through, um, yeah, how, how do you break this down? Uh, like let's okay. say you have one person, you have two people, etc. Um, the good thing is that you're often not alone. Usually the nurse is the first one who has uh, noticed and uh, press code blue and the nurses are all PCLS trained. Mm -hmm. So if you only have one person, let's say really you are called to see the patient for whatever and you're in a dark corner of the ward and the patient goes into cardiac arrest right in front of you, uh, first call for help, press the code blue button, shout for help, anything to uh, attract attention to get more people to yourself. Uh, I don't think that it's time to run to the nursing counter and things like that. Maybe there is, you can just, but if you can just call for help and get more people around and start chest compressions if the patient is in cardiac arrest. Um, every two minutes will be your pulse check and as best as you can, take note of timings of uh, what time the patient has gone down because that will be the basis of whatever uh, happens next. And it's also very important for ICU and cardiology when you want to plan uh, further interventions. So very rarely you will be the sole rescuer, but let's say for the sake of uh, argument that you are the only, really the only person there. Now, if you have two people, that is slightly better. And you will notice that here, I actually prioritize getting an IV access over ventilating the patient because this is, after all, in hospital kind of arrest mm -hmm. and advanced care and drugs are immediately available here. Yep. So your first rescuer continues CPR and um, I place a premium on the second rescuer being prepared to take over CPR. Okay? Mm -hmm. I cannot stress enough that CPR rotation is very important because studies have shown that after two minutes, even when you are not feeling tired, your CPR uh, quality does degrade and the patient should get good quality CPR. So you have to rotate the rescuer every two minutes. And if the person is not tired, but you have enough manpower, it should be a discipline that you force the rotation anyway. Um, so um, whoever is taking timing should uh, try and uh, keep track of who is the next person who's going to take over the CPR. All right. Since we are talking about inpatient, we are, we are not talking about having a Lucas or any automated CPR devices. So again, uh, if you can't take anything away from this lecture, uninterrupted CPR, with uh, rotations between rescuers is very, very important. Yeah. Now, if not, most of your patients happily should have an IV plug. Of course, there can be some waiting to go, compost, and everything's off already and suddenly, suddenly they collapse. So uh, get your IV access. Uh, we will talk about blood draws later, but you don't have to draw blood now. Just get the IV access and move on to your next uh, task. And again, try to keep track of timing. Okay, once IV access has been obtained, and uh, if the two minutes is not up yet, 
uh, you can start get the second person can start getting the crash card ID adrenaline and so on and so forth. Mm. That's okay so far, yes. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah. Now, if you have a third person, you can start focusing on the airway. And if your your, your team is inexperienced, a uh, back valve mask is fine. Okay, we will talk about uh, ventilation and cardiac arrest uh, later on. But if you cannot put in an ET or if you cannot put in an LMA, that is okay. Just a back valve mask in a 30 is to 2 or 10 is to 1 uh, ratio is okay. Yeah, because uh, like we mentioned just now, ETT is not associated with better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, whoever is uh, wh whoever is keeping track of timing continues to prepare to take over CPR. Now, if you have a fourth person, all the timings and scribing can be left to the fourth person. And um, the scribe, we'll talk about the role of the scribe a bit more later on. Yeah, but again, the scribe takes note of what hasn't been done yet and gets ready to take over CPR. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have more people, and fortunately in teaching hospitals, sometimes there are a lot of uh, other nurses, nurses, medical students, so on and so forth. The most important thing, again, is to prepare to take over CPR. They can draw drugs, they can call for uh, specialist referrals, help to call any senior doctor who hasn't been called yet, so on and so forth. All right, But um, these people should not be crowding the bit. And that's why the illustration is as such with them uh, away from the bit. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay, so that is how I would assign my roles. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about the role of the scribe. So the role of the scribe, this does not have to be the team leader. It just has to be someone who, and the team must have the under, who, who is taking note of the timing, and the team must have the understanding that this person, no matter how junior or how senior, they have the authority to call out whatever has been, whatever has not been done yet. So the scribe helps to uh, remind people when pulse checks are due, they count down 30, 30 seconds to um, pulse check, so on and so forth, so that the next uh, uh, person doing CPR can get rid of can get ready to take over. Okay. And also bear in mind that cardiac arrest is usually secondary to something else. Most of the time, it's something, it's an like ischemic heart disease, so on and so forth. But sometimes it may be an asthma attack. And while you're concentrating on the ACLS part, you may forget the routine asthma part, like puffing the MDI continuously and giving your magnesium sulfate. If you, the patient had a TCA overdose, for example, you might forget about giving your sodium bicarbonate. So sometimes there are two concurrent uh, codes to run at the same time. One is the ACLS proper, and what the other one is targeted at whatever the reversible underlying cause is. And that's why the scribe is important as well, to, because uh, they remind what hasn't been done yet. Okay. So these are some of the boards, uh, physical on the left, as well as electronic on the right, uh, that shows. Uh, the example of some of our scribing. We don't have these big bots in patient, but you can just use a piece of paper and most house officers carry a piece of paper anyway. So just uh, uh, use whatever you have on hand. Use a paper towel if you have to. I've done that as well. Yeah, okay. and you can uh, write uh, your timings and what was done when. This will be very, very important when you hand over later on. Okay. Have you tried any of like those apps where you know like it's kind of supposed to help you like log uh, the progress of ESAs or not really? No, because uh, I usually cannot find whatever I need when I'm under duress. That's true. That's true. I yeah. cannot find my calculator on my phone <laughs> when I'm under duress. Maybe someone else who's watching this podcast can, and then you can use it effectively. But just use whatever is yeah. most effective and most consistent for you. Yep. Yeah. And I guess pen and paper never fails, lah. Ah uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, okay, maybe next we can then move on to uh, the next bit about, I guess, airway, breathing, and circulation. So I think in medical school, even in the midst of training, we are um, always drilled home, always, always focus on the ABCs. But I think sometimes, um, well, we know conceptually that airway, breathing, circulation, uh, first, the question is like, what do we focus on? And what are some of the practical steps that we can do to really optimize um, doing well in these areas. So perhaps you could take us through like when you think about the airway, how do you break it down in your mind? What are your practical considerations? So on and so forth. Okay, so um, this one is just for the sake of being a systematic that we are going airway breathing circulation. Mm. Uh, because circulation and CPR still takes priority in yep. the cardiac arrest scenario. Mm. But anyway, uh, on the airway, uh, so uh, let's assume that because we're in the ward, direct laryngoscopy is usually the modality of intubation that is being used. Mm. 
in order to uh, get a good view of the laryngeal inlet, you need to position the patient properly. Yep. Okay, and this means uh, the sniffing position. Now, the sniffing position is not a hip tube chin lift kind of position. It's not just a hip tube chin lift. It's actually extension of the, it's flexion of the cervical spine and then extension of the atlanto occipital joint. Okay, so it's actually the patient bending forward and then raising the hip up. It's not just a hip tube chin lift because most of the, and uh, this is important because to facilitate this position, you need uh, something under the patient's hip. In the ward, what you usually have is a pillow. And the pillow is the thing that usually goes flying during the resuscitation because mm. people want to get it out of the way. But actually, you're taking away one of the things that can help you with intubation. Okay. If your pillow is too soft and uh, cumbersome, uh, a rolled-up blanket, like in the bottom right corner, it may be more rigid and better. Mm. If the best thing which is used by anesthesia, of course, is a donut, but I'm not sure... Uh, whether donuts are available in what. Yeah. And the reason um, we uh, put the patient in the sniffing position is because um, you can see in picture A in the center of the screen, there are actually three lines which your um, three axis which have to be all aligned in order for you to get a good view of the vocal cords. Because if your patient's in a neutral position, you know your oral axis goes all the way back before making a sharp turn to the uh, sharp turn uh, cordially uh, in order to see the cords. Whereas if you put the patient in a good position, everything lines up better and you're able to do your DL better. Mm. Okay. Uh, in this case, because we are assuming CPR is ongoing, we are not dealing with things like the bit upright uh, position and so on and so forth because uh, you, know, you can't do CPR when the patient's upright. Yeah. So yes, number one, don't throw away the pillow. It, now, it, uh, second thing I want to talk about is the concept of the trigger line. So this is a line drawn from the external orifice to the sternum. And in order for everything to line up properly, this trigger line should be anterior to the sternum. Uh, this means that if you have a very large patient, such as one on the pillow right hand corner, you may need to ramp up the patient using a succession of pillows and blankets. Some the uh, so uh, in circulation we are actually uh, trying to perfuse the heart. Uh, uh, and this is done through maintaining adequate coronary perfusion pressure. Mm. Okay, so the, as we know, the uh, coronary arteries arise from the base of the aorta. They go through the, cor the myocardium, the coronary sinus, and they empty out into the right atrium. So your coronary perfusion pressure is actually the diastolic pressure at the aorta because your coronaries fill during diastole. Okay. and uh, minus the right atrial pressure. And so coronary perfusion pressure uh, is optimized either by increasing the diastolic pressure at the, at the aorta mm -hmm. or decreasing the right atrial pressure. Yep. Okay. So this is done by uh, pushing hard. Uh, the, uh, increasing the diastolic pressure at the aorta is done by pushing hard uh, 4 to 5 cm. Uh, down and pushing fast and your rotation of rescuers comes into this as well. Mm. Okay, your decrease of your right atrial pressure is uh, done by full recoil and also by changing rescuers because tired rescuers tend to lean on the chest and yep. uh, then they don't recoil properly. And lastly, but the thing is that there's also this element of uh, momentum. So as you can see, this is a graph of um, uh, aortic pressure versus spike atrial pressure over time. Uh, you can see that during the, um, the resuscitation, the coronary perfusion pressure slowly builds up. Then yep. it drops back down to zero while the two breaths are being given and then it builds up again. Mm. Right? So the right atrial pressure, you can see, remains quite constant. The uh, aortic pressure uh, increases slowly. And when, every time you stop, uh, it goes back to zero. Yeah. So... Um, it's best to minimize interruptions. Okay. Yeah. And that means uh, planning your rotation of rescuers well, so on and so forth. La. And okay. the two minutes of uninterrupted CPR really should be uninterrupted. Yeah, yeah. There should be no random pulse checks in between, uh, so on and so forth, for as far as possible. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, in terms of circulation, still, uh, where does IV hydration or um, fluids fit into the picture in an acute resuscitation? 
Um, usually, IV hydration is takes a back seat mm. unless you are suspecting the patient has a hypovolemic cause okay. of, uh, of uh, cardiac arrest. Mm. Um, these are usually seen in children with GE. Uh, if we are talking about just hydration. Yep. In adults, it tends to be some, some of hemorrhage somewhere. Mm. In trauma patients, uh, as well as in GIB patients. Uh. Okay. And in that case, your IV hydration is only a temporizing measure when what the patient may need is blood products. Mm. So that is something to keep at the back of your mind as well. Okay, understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess tied to circulation is uh, defibrillation also. Uh, shall we move on to, to that? Or do you still have uh, something uh, to talk about? Yes, so defibrillation, yeah. So there's actually been a three-phase uh, model of cardiac arrest that's been proposed. Um, basically, uh, it's hy it was hypothesized in 2002 that when people go into uh, VF arrest, the first, in, during the first four minutes is what they call the electrical phase. They are very susceptible for, to defibrillation. Mm. And we catch most, uh, most of these patients, like those that come into ED, um, they are... They go into VF right in front of you and then you shock them and they immediately come back to full consciousness and are able to sign their own consent form. Mm. Yeah. So um, uh, this, it, this part is very crucial. If you see acute, uh, if you see a shockable rhythm evolve right in front of you, it's very crucial to defibrillate the patient quickly and safely. Mm. That's why ACLS places such a big premium on being able to recognize a shockable rhythm, which is VF or Basel SPT. Now, after four minutes is what people hypothesize to be the circulatory phase. So what this means is that um, the patient um, is more susceptible to defibrillation if the heart is perfused for a bit first. So okay. by doing CPR, uh, a one round of CPR before doing your defibrillation, um, it makes the chances of cardioversion more like, makes the chances of defibrillation, sorry, more likely. And after 10 minutes, uh, unfortunately, this is what is called the metabolic phase. CPR, the efficacy of CPR and defibrillation drop off very sharply because of all the end organ damage, bacterial translocation, ischemia from the arrest, and peripheral basal constriction from your adrenaline. Um, yeah, all the inflammatory markers have set in and it becomes very difficult to bring the patient back. And unfortunately, ROSD at this phase has also been hypothesized to cause worsening tissue damage due to reperfusion injury. I see. And the treatment targeted at the metabolic phase is rare because of the poor outcomes associated with such patients. And these treatments mm -hmm. include ECMO as well as uh, targeted temperature management or what we call therapeutic hypothermia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why you don't see many patients go from um, a code to ECMO or TTM because uh, these are uh, precious resources and are used in select groups of patients. Nah. Okay. So yeah. I just wanted to yeah, ask a bit more about the, the first two phases and whether you translate this into practice, i.e. Yes. like, um, yeah, so, so what, practically how does this translate onto the ground in terms of should I shock first, should I CPR first? Um, it yeah. is uh, largely hypothetical because realistically you won't be able to tell where uh, in, the, in the three phases the patient is Mm. Yeah, the patient may have had VF later. He may have just come out of VF and it's now an ACE story. You won't know. Yep. So anyway, ACLS um, uh, says if you see a shockable rhythm, shock immediately. And yep. then mm. no pulse check after that. Just continue with two minutes of continuous CPR. Mm. And if the patient has, still has a shockable rhythm, shock a second time. And I will illustrate this a bit more later on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, right. Um, there is also... Um, a drug, so adrenaline as well, sodium bicarbonate. Mm. Adrenaline works by its alpha adrenergic effect um, by peripheral basal constriction, F4, causing blood to return to the heart and the brain. Yep. It is not so much about flogging the heart using the beta chronotropy and inotropy, but it's more of the uh, basal constriction. Okay. Um, Adrenaline comes at its own price because adrenaline with the peripheral basal constriction causes uh, worsening ischemia. It can cause increased myocardial oxygen demand mm. and uh, therefore um, higher doses or more frequent doses are not associated with better outcomes. In fact, they are associated with worse outcomes. Okay. So at the moment, the recommendation for adrenaline is every three to four minutes which as you uh, will notice, is about every two pulse checks. 
So very frequently, adrenaline is given with every pulse check in the world. Yep. It should not be the case. It should be every alternate pulse check. Okay. Yes. So um, uh, the, the jury is out regarding um, high doses of adrenaline, weight-adjusted doses of adrenaline and all that. But for the purpose of ECRS, it is still uh, 1 mg every 2 pounds checks. Okay. okay. Yep. Carbonate is uh, indicated for cardiac arrest, secondary to severe hyperkalemia or uh, TCA overdose. But it should not be given routinely because it may lead to worsen respiratory acidosis through this equation because um, your bicarbonate combines with the um, acid and then it just becomes CO2. So from basically, you get a respiratory acidosis. And uh, do take note that you don't have effective gas exchange. So it's not as though you can blow off the CO2 like in your uh, ventilated patients. Okay. Um, additionally, um, the high sodium load, this is 8.4% compared to 0.9% of your normal saline. line. Mm. The high sodium load, uh, can cause uh, uh, abnormal electrolyte shifts. It's a very concentrated solution. It can cause uh, more inflammation, so on and so forth. So bicarbonate is not routinely indicated for all um, for all resuscitations. Okay. Yes. Um, do you throw it in, in? So like, let's say no hyper-K, no TCA, but the resus is going on for quite a while and your downtime is getting a bit longer. Um, do you bring it on board just because of um, the thinking that it's a, it's a long downtime, there's probably some element of uh, acidemia in the picture or generally not really? Um, this is very uh, senior doctor dependent. Even okay. in the mm -hmm. emergency department, uh, yep. you know, I think people practice differently. I myself mm -hmm. uh, don't really do so. Yeah. Okay, so basically it's not really a very evidence-based territory yes. in terms of really having shown improved outcomes by just throwing sodium bicarb in the patients. Lah. Yes, that's okay. right. So yeah. the take home is the two indications would be hyperkalemia uh, as well as uh, TCA uh, overdose. Yes. Uh, beyond yes. that, then it's a bit, um, it's uh, not really individual anything. practice. Yeah. Sure. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Which okay. Uh, cannot be talked about here. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing, sure thing. Okay. okay, so operationalizing the ACLS algorithm, time zero, when you see the patient actually go into PF, you would give a shock, you would start CPR. Mm -hmm. Time two, where your second pulse check, two minutes on. If the patient is still in VF, you would shock a second time, and now you will give your first adrenaline. Um, actually, um, adrenaline has been prioritized as to be given at the second shock and not at the first, because uh, we always assume, firstly, that adrenaline is not yet prepared. Mm. It's still in its bound. But I have asked uh, other ACLS instructors, um, if you had adrenaline at the bits like that, then would you give it at time mm. zero? And the answer is because... Um, uh, shockable rhythms tend to do a bit worse with adrenaline uh, given early over defibrillation. So it should still be given at the second uh, shock. Okay. So for example, if you have shock and the patient has RO acid during your first two minutes of uh, CPR, then your adrenaline bolus actually may not, may actually cause more harm. I mm, understand. Yes. Okay. Okay, so in the second minute, um, you will continue CPR. If you still see PF, you would uh, give uh, defibrillation and you would give your first dose of adrenaline. And because this is now refractory VF, having seen a VF that did not uh, defibrillate back to a sinus rhythm at your first shot, you would give your first dose of amiodarone 300 mg. Okay, um, at the fourth minute will be your third pulse check. Um, you would hold off the adrenaline because it's supposed to be given every alternate uh, pulse check. Okay. You would uh, perform a defibrillation and you would give your second dose of amiodarone. Okay. At, your, at the six minute, you would give your defibrillation and adrenaline. There's no more amiodarone for the rest of the resuscitation already. Yeah. And then it just continues from there with a defibrillation every two minutes and an adrenaline every alternate pulse check. Got it. Now, if you have a non-shockable rhythm, defibrillation and amiodarone go out the window, uh, you will give your adrenaline during the second, every alternate pulse check. Okay. If you have it on hand, right away, you can give it straight away as well. Okay. Now, the important thing about this chart is that it shows that intervention is given after a pulse check. So, is, after a pulse check, if it is a shockable rhythm, then you will give your medication and your defibrillation. Okay. Uh, why uh, this is, instead of giving, uh, say, adrenaline in the 
middle of the two minute CPR cycle. Hmm. And the reason for this is because we want to assess whether the patient is still in a, uh, still in a cardiac arrest rhythm before we give interventions. Okay. If you give intervention in the middle of a CPR cycle, you won't know whether the patient has ROS sleep while the CPR is ongoing and maybe hmm. you are inflicting harm again. Okay. Yeah. Now, all other medication, for example, calcium gluconate, uh, insulin dextrose, so um, sodium bicarbonate, you can give it uh, whenever lah, because that one is not dependent on the rhythm, it's dependent on the underlying um, situation. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so I guess the next bit is, um, so after we've operationalized the um, ACLS, uh, I, I guess, and while this is happening, where and when do uh, investigations like blood taking, um, imaging, etc. fit to the picture? Yes. All right, uh, investigations honestly have quite minimal value during the cardiac arrest because mm. everything is very deranged while the patient is in cardiac arrest. Yep. The patient will, is, and trying to draw blood even through a femoral puncture while CPR is ongoing is likely to be uh, at least moderate risk la, for the rescuer. Yep. You can do a VBG or ABG, but acidosis is all but to be expected, mm. except if your patient is very recently collapsed. Yep. Potassium level may be of value, especially if you can get it on a point of care test like an ABG. Mm. But elevated potassium may also be due to cell death. Yeah. Okay, so while the patient is in cardiac arrest, I mean everything else, your full blood count, your CRP, brocal, etc. is unlikely to change the outcome of the resus simply because it takes at least half an hour to come out. And within half an hour, the patient has either survived or you all have termina terminated the resuscitation. And if the patient has survived, your blood test will probably be more accurate uh, when it is taken after the patient has ROSC. Nah. Okay. Yeah. But again, you know, people um, try and do things because they are familiar with doing things. So you see mm. there's uh, people try and take blood because they know how to take blood. Nah. Yeah. yeah. But um, again, during the cardiac arrest, probably just uh, blood gas is mm. fine. Yeah, everything else can be done after that. Yep. Yes. All radiological investigations can be done after that as well. Yep. So um, your attention pneumothorax, all that, as we have mentioned earlier, is all by clinical assessment only. Mm. After the patient has uh, recovered, you can send a patient for chest x-ray to check your EVD placement. Mm. You can send a patient for CD scan to see whether the SAH is the cause of the cardiac arrest, so yep. on and so forth. Mm. Um, so uh, do take note that the acidosis seen on an intra-cardiac arrest uh, blood gas um, does not mean that you need to give bicarbonate because yeah. all patients are going to be acidotic, as I mentioned. Mm. But uh, if you... Um, and this, sorry, this acidosis is likely to resolve very quickly after the patient ROSC is... Okay. Um, by uh, restoration of... Uh, circulation as well as by your ventilation. Okay. Once your patient has ROSC, you can start to ventilate the patient at a faster rate and so on and so forth to try and correct the underlying uh, acidosis. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks John. Okay, All right. maybe we can move on to the last two bits, uh, which would be firstly, um, so the patient has ROSC and yay, uh, you've um, gotten a return of uh, spontaneous circulation. So what should we be doing next at this point in time? Okay, so um, there are a few uh, components uh, to the post ROSC bundle. The mm -hmm. first is your clinical targets. So your uh, SpO2 has to be maintained 94 to 98%. This yep. is through the use of your, SP your humble SpO2 probe. Uh, maintain normal carbia. Uh, that means your PCO2 has to be around, should be aimed around 40. And this is targeted through the performance of an ABG. Your mean arterial pressure should be above 65, and this can be done with your humble blood pressure cuff until you get the patient to an uh, arterial line. Mm. And you should maintain normal glycemia, and this is done through your hypo count as well. Yep. Okay, there are some investigations that you can do immediately after we, uh, ROSC. The first is your 12 lead ECG mm. in case uh, there's a STEMI that needs PCI. Mm. And secondly is your radiological investigations, your chest x-ray um, if available immediately. If not, after you have transferred the patient to definitive care, I guess it can be that done there too. Okay. Right? 
um, there are some post ROSC medications, and this is these are usually infusions for whatever caused the cardiac arrest. For example, if it was a VF, you have to start amiodarone. If um, it was TCA, you have to start your bicarbonate infusion. Mm. And don't forget that if your patient starts picking up, you may have to give sedation or analgesia, yep. uh, IV fentanyl, IV propofol, so on and so forth. Mm. Lastly, will be your specialist consults. ICU almost certainly will be involved. Uh, and cardiology will have to be involved if the ECG shows uh, STEMI. Okay. And there's also this element of managing a ventilated patient. So um, someone experienced with managing ventilated patients should be present. Uh, lung protective ventilation is a whole lecture on its own, and that should be started for the patient. If um, you are getting someone to manually bag the patient, you must tell the operator at what rate and how much. Hmm. Yeah, so if you want the earlier on, we were bagging around 10, 8 to 10 breaths per minute. Now that the hmm. patient has ROSC, you have to tell your uh, airway person, you have, now you have to start bagging faster, so on hmm. and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, what rate normally, like let's say while well, they are just awaiting to transfer to ICU, uh, um, be mm. Because I'm almost certainly sure that the patient is acidotic, I'll probably yep. start around 20 or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can. Okay. And I guess the final bit, uh, so now you've already kind of stabilized the patient and most of the time, like you mentioned, these patients will end up heading to the intensive care unit. So how do we best uh, optimize the preparation for transfer and uh, what should we be taking note as we are moving this patient to sort of definitive disposition? Okay, so you have to know the routes and the timings, uh, how long it will take for you to get to your destination. Mm. Um, your transfers may be either intra-hospital or inter-hospital. Mm. Um, and of course, the latter is longer and more complicated. Yep. You have to make the journey as smooth as possible. So get someone to hold the lift, make sure the ambulance is here already before you move the patient out of the hospital, so on and so forth. You have to plan the manpower. So you have to ensure that whoever is doing the transportation has adequate training to troubleshoot an intubated patient. Yep. So things like being familiar with the DOPS, D-O-P-S, um, mnemonic. Um, the, whoever is escorting the patient should know these things. Yep. Definitely should not be left to the house officer. Yeah. The patient, uh, ideally, if the patient is on infusions, whoever is transporting should be able to nitrate the infusions along the way. Okay, um, if you move the patient, it, after that you can do your planning by airway breathing and circulation. Mm. If you move the patient, um, hold the tube. So usually it's the nurses or the porters pushing the patient and the doctor walking beside uh, the patient just looking at the monitor. But the good practice is whenever the bed is unlocked, the, someone should be holding the tube and stabilizing it because all it takes is for your ventilator to hook on a passing uh, I don't know what, uh, another bed or a cardiac table and you will have extubated the patient and that is, will be a major delay. Yeah, so uh, one of the first few times I transported a ventilated patient just from my EDP1 to the EDCT scanner, my senior consultant told me, hold on to the tube, your life depends on it. And I said, do you mean his life, prof? Then he said, his life as well. <laughs> so yeah, it's quite important. Uh. For breathing, uh, check the oxygen supply. Sometimes the oxygen tank that comes is barely uh, almost out of oxygen itself. Mm. Your BVM should be pre-assembled, not in its box, in its different components. Because okay. when you need it, you will be under stress and mm. you will not be able to assemble it efficiently. Yep. For circulation, ensure you have sufficient medication. So for example, you're transferring from Ng Teng Fong to NUH, a 15-minute transfer. Mm. If your patient is in danger of going to cardiac arrest again, you should have a 15 divided by 4, around 4 adrenalines prepared, pre-drawn yep. and filled for the transfer because there is no time to draw drugs during a transfer. Yep. Um, disability, Lores, if you anticipate seizures, Lores, if mm. yeah, all that all should be prepared as well. So whoever is transporting must know how to use the equipment, must know how to manipulate the ventilator, infusion pumps, use the defibrillator, and so on and so forth. And if you are the senior supervising a transfer, you must quiz your juniors about whether they know these things before you let them go. Finally, ensure whoever is receiving is ready before moving the patient. Mm. Because sometimes there are some miscommunications, patient goes up to ICU from ED, before ICU is prepared and all that is not good for the patient as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
So okay. that's my take on transfer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, okay, yes. so finally, we've come to the end of uh, the questions. Uh, thanks so much. I think it's been really helpful for myself also. Uh, and uh, maybe we can just focus on some uh, take-home points to the listeners. What do you think is really the most important things to bear in mind when running? So, out? yes, don't interrupt CBR. Mm. Uh, scribe and take note of timings. Yep. And uh, I guess that is the most important thing I have because not interrupting CBR is... Uh, probably the thing that uh, will save the life during the cardiac arrest. Yep. Everything else, whether you can intubate, whether you put in your, how fast you put in your adrenaline, all that, these are important, yep. but uh, nothing is important as not interrupting CPR. And okay. because we are all trying to, we are all progressing to a time where we may become more senior, it's important to think about things like scribing and all that so that you can oversee the resus efficiently. Okay. Otherwise, Try and put it into practice. Uh, the next time you have a code, I hope you don't have one, but unfortunately, inevitably, you will have one. Uh, try and put it into practice. You may only be able to put into practice one or two things at a time. Maybe your next code, you will focus only on giving uninterrupted CPR, and that is fine. Maybe you will forget everything about the scribing, the taking timings, all that is okay. But if you have watched this, and then after that, you just focus on not interrupting CPR and making sure you have a steady flow of rescuers to rotate in. That is okay. Next quote, maybe you will start scribing, and then you will get better from there. Yes, so uh, uh, take things one at a time as well. Okay, thanks a lot, John. I'll uh, try to apply that to myself. Okay, All thank right. you.